Today's episode is brought to you by Herdacity. Herdacity is a nonprofit inspiring confidence in women to achieve their professional goals. For resources, networking opportunities, and a strong community of women, visit herdacity.org to learn more. Welcome to Herdacious, a podcast for audacious women. Welcome to you all to Herdacious, the podcast for audacious women looking to gain some ground in their career. I'm Lorelai, and I'm glad you chose to join us today because we are going to be speaking about how to challenge power within the workplace and within your personal life. To join me in this conversation, I have a prolific former chief people officer and host of Not the HR Lady, Tara. Hi. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you. I'm super pleased to have you. I think this conversation is going to be really interesting. And I know that when it comes to challenging power, you are a powerful voice to listen to. So I'm really pleased you chose to join us in this conversation today. Well, thank you. I'm totally honored. I appreciate that so much. You as well. Thank you. To get us started, I want to get a baseline for what challenging power really means. Yeah, it's exactly as it sounds. We in the workplace, women specifically, have so many inherent challenges with just being exactly that, an executive woman in this space of uh, of any work environment. It's very difficult for us a lot of times just naturally because we're women. And so when you are trying to challenge authority or challenge another executive even, that can be scary. That can be uh, intimidating. That can absolutely potentially end your career, which is crazy to say Mm -hmm. because powers are challenged all the time. I watch it with male counterparts, challenging another male counterpart's point of view. For us, we have to be a little bit more intentional and a little bit more, dare I say, delicate, but not in the way it might sound at first. Right. Uh, Just to ensure that we're not some crazy, irrational woman with our women feelings and opinions uh, coming in to, you know, say whatever it is that we want. And those are direct quotes, like from from some executives I've worked with, unfortunately. Quote, unquote, crazy, irrational woman. Crazy, irrational women. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's uh, it's it's important for us to really be able to maintain so much composure and think about so many different things all at the same time when merely pushing back on an idea. So it's that what I what I think is so important for us to do is to have that strong voice where our opinions, our values, our ideas, what we bring to the table is heard and more accepted in a meaningful and positive way. Because guess what? We can affect probably even more change than you can imagine in organizations with your profit, your bottom line, your happiness, et cetera, if you just listened from time to time and allow the challenge to happen just as you would with anybody else. So I like talking about this topic because it plagues, I think, a lot of us. Then help us get started in this process. Where does a woman start when she needs to build up the courage and the fortitude and the confidence to be able to challenge power in appropriate situations? That's a great question. And it's one that I get asked a lot. And I think the first and foremost thing you have to do and understand is who you are, what you believe, what you are comfortable negotiating, what you're never willing to sacrifice. The person who you show up as every single day is who you're going to be remembered as, right? So Mm -hmm. you come into a place in a professional setting, in a restaurant, in your social life, at your kid's school, et cetera. No matter where you are, you come into a place and your first opportunity or impression with everybody is sort of exactly as you show up that first day. That that interesting kind of balance of who am I? What do I stand for? What do I believe? How am I going to communicate that authentic self to everybody else. But before you can, you really have to be in touch with it yourself. So what are your values? What do you believe in? What kind of organizations would you consider working for? What do they value? Does it align, et cetera? So assuming we know that, but that's the starting point, right? Now what? Now you have to come and lead with that. And so many times I think women are taught to be agreeable, Mm -hmm. to not challenge the status quo. Be polite. Be polite, yes. And and that couldn't be further from what's actually needed in the workplace. We are not second-class citizens. Mm -hmm. We're not um, meant to be quiet. We're meant to share our brains just as our male counterparts are as well. So I think coming to that realization, and it's hard to do. I'm going to be 40 this year. 
COVID kind of screwed it up. So I'm going to go with, I'm going to be 39 for one whole extra year because it doesn't count, right? <laughs> you uh, can't host the big 40 party. Exactly. What's the point? I should be traveling. I'm not. Um, so I'm turning 40 this year and it's honestly taken me almost this long to really learn that it's okay to show up as you in the workplace. And when you work with others, when you're around others, when you are in a place where they understand your impact, the loudness, the the lack of being polite, right? All of that is just you. And that's who you show up as. And that's what they like. And that's what they hired. And there you are. What you see is what you get. Your authentic self. Your authentic self. But it didn't, for me anyway, It it's not something like I've always just came out of the gate like this. Right. Right. So you have to, at some point, discover what what you want to challenge and why, what you're passionate about and why, what you're going to do differently next time and why. And when you got that all figured out, or at least a little bit figured out, then you can really start to build that confidence to say, you know what? I do belong here. I have a seat at the table for a reason. My opinions are valid, but that negative stuff keeps creeping in a lot of times going, you know what? Actually, you should be quiet. You shouldn't okay. lean in. What do you know? Right? Right. Right. You might be the youngest person in the room. That's been the case for me a lot. So on top of being a, a woman leader, I've, I've been in the C-suite since I was 28. So you also kind of get that whole ageism thing going on where they don't want to hear your ideas. If I hear one more time about millennial this or millennial yeah. that, I mean, right. it's it's like the new business slur for meaning you, you're too young. You're to too know. young. You suck. Like, it's terrible. Yeah. I, I, you know, I just hate that. But once you get a piece of who you are, what you stand for, and what you can actually affect. And maybe it'll take you actually affecting something in a meaningful way where you did push back to gain the confidence. But when you do it, that is power. And then you start to show people who you really are and what you're capable of. With the knowing of yourself comes the ability to be able to express your values, beliefs, your knowledge, etc. You and I both know there are some gender-specific hurdles in the workplace in general, but specifically when it comes to challenging power. Talk to me about those. Absolutely. Uh, you know, it's funny. It's not funny, actually. It's tragic <laughs> what I'm about to tell you. Laugh but, instead of cry. Uh, yeah. I mean, you have to. And I'll give you a real example of something that actually happened where I had to do just that. I had joined uh, at the request of a great, still great friend and mentor who had taken over and taken on a role of CEO, was doing a reverse acquisition, 800 person company turning into a 4,500 person company. Wow. And it was obviously a huge challenge, lots of different systems. They had nobody in charge of HR. I wasn't looking for a role. And so I came in an advisory capacity at first, had been there three weeks. Having been there three weeks, I jumped into what was about to already be released, had done beta testing, everything, new HRIS software. The CFO was actually running this project because there was no HR leader, had been running it for the past year. We go on this executive retreat. I'm coming to help facilitate, help coordinate, you know, kind of share the vision for the people strategy. I was actively looking for someone to be the head of HR. On the airplane between LA and Miami, Payroll had gone out with the new system, and it was just trash. Like, nobody got paid correctly. Ooh. Everything was wrong. 401k. It's every possible catastrophe <sighs> oh, no. that, that could happen. And I don't say that I didn't lead the project because I don't want responsibility. I, ultimately, I sort of had responsibility in the sense that it's an HRIS project, and while I don't actually work there uh, and wasn't the one doing it, I'll, I'll own it, right? Half of the people who were, like, on the de facto team I was with uh, were on the project and it, and it failed. So I land, find out my phone has 8,000 messages on it. Ooh. It's before Wi-Fi. Oh on yeah. Planes. Good, good. So, so nice we surprise. Get, right. So we get there. I'm checking all the messages. I hear everything. It's fairly late. We get to, uh, the next day I, I have to laugh about it. We've already now in about seven hours, fixed the problem, got all the payroll stuff done, knocked it out but people were pissed, as you could imagine. Sure. And to help soften the blow for the morning executive meeting, again, the first one I went to, I stopped at the gas station and bought everybody payday bars. Just Aww. in an attempt to lighten the mood. Because what are you going to do? It is what it is. But hey, it was fixed. By this time, the very next day, it was fixed. 
So I handed out the, you know, bars and stuff. And I led with, here's what happened. Here's how we fixed it. And uh, the, the chief technology officer uh, looked over at me and literally called me the C word. He goes, what kind of see you next Tuesday would let something like this happen? Is this the kind of impression you're hoping to make by joining the company? Like, oh, okay. Yeah. So there are inherent challenges. I have never in my life heard a male colleague speak to another male colleague with such disdain and such aggression in a professional setting. I mean, it's just inappropriate. Like maybe you guys do that in happy hour and we don't hear it, but this is a literal meeting that we're having and I'm the only woman in the room. So it, again, you know, there's that really just like, what? Would, would you be saying that if this guy over here was in charge? And by the way, that guy right there was the one that was in charge. And what did he do? Sat there silently. He was embezzling $2 million. While so that's a different story. Called. But oh, yeah, good, good. yeah. But yes, while I was being called the C word. He was uh, sitting quietly. He was sitting there quietly just allowing. So absolutely. There is a huge bias and a lot of things that women face. And some of that is just derogatory name calling. But when you have the president of the country calling people Pocahontas, I suppose what else can you expect? You know, other leaders believe that that's an appropriate uh, thing to call people, you know, that name calling is just fine. Right. We're normalizing that. Behavior. We're normalizing it. Yeah. But gender bias has been present in the workplace for Ever. ages. Yeah. So give me a few more specific gender hurdles yeah. in the workplace where we come up against the bar of challenging power in disproportionate power differentials. I think anytime you establish yourself as an expert, as a woman, it's incredibly difficult for folks to get around the fact that you may know what you're talking about. <laughs> and I find often that there's a validation by another man. I can I could give you another example. So maybe I've done 10 HRIS implementations in my whole career. Mm -hmm. And I'm sharing that. I've done the research. I know what I need. I let everybody know it's going to save us this amount of money. Subject matter expert, right? Mm -hmm. Except, well, are you sure? George we're, needs you to prove it. We're Yeah, we're going to bring on this other guy, this other white male guy, because that we're more comfortable hearing that information from him who would then just draw the same conclusion. Right. Just say it in a slightly different way. Uh, say it in a man voice. I don't know. Yeah. I could get low. Like, look at we need to have an HR. Maybe <laughs> maybe this is very the way believable. Of the future. We just we just walk around with that. Like, you know how on like Snapchat, you can put a filter and become like a dude. Yeah. That maybe that's just it. Women already tried that in the 80s and the 90s it's with true. those really terrible coats. I feel like we can just keep moving on. I, I'm with you. I'm totally joking. My mom had one of those coats. I don't <laughs> want to go back. Girl, I don't want to go back to pantyhose. All right. All right. So in the conversations that we are having when it comes to challenging power, gender neutral. Yeah. You're going to hit a point where there's a point counterpoint situation where they're going to come back at you. Yeah. Whether they're being offensive, defensive, or just trying to ask clarifying questions. What do we do? It's really important as women leaders to come with facts, not emotion. So many times we are quick to be defensive and that's that's fine. Who We are who we are and we're going to react how we're going to react. But to my earlier point, we have to be a little bit more calculated, a little bit more intentional about our responses in order to ensure that we're going to be heard. Mm -hmm. I feel, I think, we have to get those words out of our vocabulary so that we can come in and go... Here's what it is. This is the facts. We're going to save X number of dollars. I've vetted this, this, and that. It's going to run concurrent, whatever, whatever the problem is, right? So to remove, I feel we need yeah. to do this. I think we need to do this. Yeah. Take that out of the conversation. Take that out of the equation. Come in, come in solid. You know, you don't think. Here's the situation. Here's the solution or the potential solutions. Absolutely. Let's go. Absolutely. And when you get that combative, well, what about this? Well, what about that? Well, did you think about this? Of course you did. Of Great you point. Did. Thank you for talking about that. Here's where I address this. That's exactly right. If you'll just hold on for a second, we're going to get there in about three minutes. And you just continue to, to do that. And you have an answer for every possible scenario that's going to get thrown at you, as many as you can think of. Give me another facts, not emotion. So another, uh, another time would be you need to fire somebody. I have somebody on my team who is just not working out, who is, you know, just a absolutely terrible employee. I've written them up. I've done all of this. I've, you know, et cetera, et cetera, coached. You're the person they're speaking to as their trusted advisor in my role as a CPO. 
oftentimes that's the case, I could absolutely think that this person is wrong, that this leader doesn't know what they're talking about, that this person is awesome. They've done maybe some side projects for me. Mm -hmm. I think they're great, but I only know them two hours a month. I have to put emotion aside as a leader and that, that goes with everybody. So you are talking to your boss about somebody on your team. Well, your boss hired them before you were ever there, but you're the boss now and you're in charge of them and you need to let them go. That's a difficult conversation to have, right? Always maintaining the, a, a little bit of a lack of emotion and sticking with facts as an, in an HR capacity, as a people leader, a lot of times we're governed by what did you do in order to be able to justify this termination because I have to, I have to hold it up in a court of law. So please explain all the steps you took. I have to look for any potential bias. Are they terminating all their women? Are they terminating people of color? I've actually had that happen. We're about three in. Now they had all the appropriate documentation, right? They mm -hmm. did all the write-ups. They did all the things, all the appropriate things. But then doing an investigation on them after a few complaints and three terminations of people of color only to find out that that person is definitely firing with bias. So sometimes you have to put your emotion, whether it's you agree, disagree, they're your friend, they're not your friend, you hired them, you have to put that aside and look at the facts. Sometimes the facts lead you in a completely different direction. But then you have to follow those facts. And being and remaining objective is paramount to leadership because people are going to know that you're fair. I love those specific examples. And I think now is a really good time for a sponsor break. What? Okay, okay. All right right okay. now? All right, now. It is now time for a sponsor break. We'll be back in a moment. Hi, Barbie here from Moonray, husband and wife indie pop duo. If you enjoy the intro music, we invite you to listen to our WEP Honeymoon, streaming now on all platforms. Visit www.moonray-music.com for more. And we're back talking with Tara about challenging power. Tara, I want to pick up right where we left off in the conversation of challenging power point counterpoint situation. What are some common pitfalls when it comes to challenging power in a professional way? Whenever we get into rallying the troops, instead of continuing to arm ourselves with facts, without continuing to dig into like what they might say in return, what that you heard them say, maybe in the meeting, you know, instead of doing your research, instead of continuing to just be armed with facts, sometimes, and maybe I'm speaking for myself, but I can speak for every single one of my girlfriends that I talk about this stuff with, that, that we all do it, that they do it too. Do what? It's natural for us to rally the troops by sharing all of our frustrations and getting them angry about the same things we're angry about. Now, that's great. You can do that. That's certainly something uh, that sometimes you need. You need lots of voices in order to affect change sometimes. So I'm not saying that's not what you would always do, but if it's situational and you're confronting, you're confronting and challenging power about something specific, which I would assume this would be most of the case, you're looking for something specific and you're challenging something that you don't agree with, rallying the troops does very little for you because you're not going to end up with like, let's say in my capacity as CPO, all of my VPs, my directors, whatever, they're not coming into the executive meeting with me. They're not the ones talking to the rest of the team sharing how brilliant I am and how brilliant my idea is and why it's going to work. It's not them, right? They don't matter. Right. It's you. You're it's standing me. alone. I have to stand up there the and thing. do it. Yeah. Right. So I can boost myself I can practice with my team. I can get them to throw objections at me. There's a lot of different ways that I can rally the troops in a much more, you know, interesting and is going to actually do me good sort of way, you know, practice with them. What would you say in, re you know, in response? That's great. But just kind of bitching or having like wine over it and, mm -hmm. you know, getting people just to, yeah, you know, to hell with Steve. Like right. that's, that doesn't solve anything. Steve's in the wrong. You're yeah, definitely right. Absolutely. Feels good. Not <laughs> constructive. Feels good. Completely not constructive. And and it's going to do you more harm than good because you're going to come in angry. You don't need to come in angry. You're not mad at Steve. You're mad because you can't get them to understand your point 
or you believe that they're being contrary just to be contrary or they're stepping in. That's okay. They probably are. All of those things could be true. Who knows? But still go in the best you, not angry, factual, Mm -hmm. ready to kind of go, yeah, cool. Let's talk about this though. Okay. So when we're talking about this and we're coming in there with our facts, a lot of us know as adults, we probably have to compromise, right? How does one compromise when there are certain situations where we know we're right? We know they're wrong. We know that new policy is discriminatory or aggressive or whatever. How do we reconcile the right versus wrong with the need to compromise and move forward as a team? Yeah, that's a great question because that's always going to come up. Two things. You may have to compromise. you may have to compromise some things. What I would suggest you don't compromise is anything that are morals and values to you. You know, talk about that authenticity back at the beginning. Mm -hmm. We have the opportunity to say, this is what we stand for. If we compromise the big ones, if we allow a sexual harasser to continue to stay in the workplace, if we allow for that, then our morals are such that we're gonna protect the company. There's a lot of people that do that. There are a lot of people in my role I have done it. I'm not proud. I've Mm -hmm. been complicit. I'm not complicit anymore. Mm -hmm. So that's a huge one is like, you have to understand what do you value? Mm -hmm. What, what, who is your authentic self? What are your morals? And then the, the second thing is what are you willing to compromise? What can you be a little bit more lenient on? Where can you go? You know what? My, my hard red line is here, but But here and here, I have the opportunity to kind of go, you know what, this is cool. I can give, I can take, as long as it's not costing you. If you're compromising who you are to make a compromise, I think you really have to decide, is this the right space for you, right? Is this the right way for you to be able to affect change? Sometimes the answer is no. In my case, it's been no. And I've I have moved on as a result because I'm not willing to compromise what my values are anymore. I watched The Devil Wears Prada the other night with my daughters. We had a daughter date, and um, we had a little camp out in my bedroom. They're little unicorn blankets. Watched The Devil Wears Prada. No idea how interesting of a business movie that is. When you really break it down, the very end, Meryl Streep's character says to Anne Hathaway's character, I see a great deal of myself in you. And Anne Hathaway says to her, I'm nothing like you. I could never do what you just did. And And Meryl Streep says back to her, you already did it with Emily. And that was a really interesting moment, I thought, because she had a choice to make at that time. She could either continue to compromise morals. She actually didn't realize she was compromising, maybe. But when it was called out, she was like, you know what? I'm not taking this. And then you see her get out of the car, walk over to the fountain in Paris, and uh, see her boss call. Meryl Streep's calling her, and she laughs and throws the phone in the fountain and then finds another job that is much more her, that doesn't make her compromise those values. Well, fairy tale endings are really nice, but we're all in an economic downturn For right sure. now. So I can't necessarily walk away from my job because my morals and values are not the same as my company. Because let's face it, I feel like companies are amoral. Yeah, absolutely. They, they are not people in my book. <laughs> no, so, I'm with you. What's the real world woman going to do when you're coming up against these hard edges? Yeah. And that's a great question. Fairy tale endings are one thing. And it's beautiful to be able to do what she did. Right. But to your point, there's like, what, 40 million unemployed Americans? People just want a job. (sighs) We'll take anything at this point. It's it's terrible. My friend just lost her job yesterday. Uh, And so it's very, very stressful time for all of us. I wish everybody could use this voice and could affect change in this sort of way so that companies could really see like, hey, we're just not taking any more. But that's not the reality, and I realize that. So what can you do? You can absolutely still advocate and champion for change. You can ask questions during the interview process that make those recruiters go back to their boss, which hopefully makes them go back to their boss and the higher-ups in the organization that, hey, people are asking about what our stance is on Black Lives Matter. People are asking about you know, what do we do from a from a diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging standpoint? I'm getting asked these questions. Now, are you going to get rejected for a job for asking some of those questions? I don't know. Maybe. Uh, but I, I, I'd push back on, 
hey, you know how you get those one job uh, interviews that you just really don't want, but you take it for the practice anyway? It's like right. the one you hope wouldn't call. Try it on those and <laughs> see like what, because if you don't care anyway, like who cares? Start pushing back. This is a really tiny way. So just as much as there can be microaggression, and there's a lot of that, I feel like we could do little micro suggestions uh, very, very discreetly to organizations by way of potentially just reframing how we ask questions during the interview process, putting out what is important to us, putting out, you know, little nuggets of the she, her on our LinkedIn, like really starting to continue just to talk in even innocuous ways about, wow, did you know that women only make 82 cents to the dollar and people of color who are women make only 76 to the dollar to white males? Like just little nuggets of things you can kind of throw in here and they're little micro suggestions. Uh, and I, why not, right? Flip the script on uh, on how it's normally done to us. You know the trick we do to get, you know, the other leaders in the company to like believe it was their idea. Oh yeah, that so you plant the seed. Exactly. Early. So like same idea. Let's just plant the seeds differently a little bit and more of them. Tara, I want to wrap this into a nice little bow. Give me a big picture framework of all of the details we just discussed, just so that we can have a really brief takeaway for challenging power? I would love to. Let's break it down really simply. Four easy steps. Be your authentic self. Figure that out. Figure out who that is and do that. Do that every day. Lead with facts, not emotion. Arm yourself with as much information. Arm yourself with as much information as possible. You, you have to know the rebuttals. You have to know the facts. Don't rally the troops. Stop talking about it. Instead of talking about it, Talk about it in meaningful ways that are going to help prepare you when you're the one standing there challenging that, that power. And then finally, don't lose who you are in the process. You have to be true to yourself. Now, you mentioned we're in a bad economy. We are. Mm -hmm. There are certain things, even in the worst economy, I can't and won't sacrifice anymore. Right. Not everybody is as, as fortunate as I am to be in that position. I recognize that. You can still not lose yourself while providing for your family. Just don't sit there and be complicit. Don't sit there and, and not challenge when things are actually wrong. Bad behavior that you're seeing, illegal practices, biases, discrimination. When you see that stuff, say something. Micro suggestions, right? Yeah. Uh, if they can microaggress us, we can micro suggest to them. And, uh, and I, I think I like that flipping of the script. It, we need to do more of it. I love that very much. Thank you for sharing. And lastly, share with us a few resources for us to really get out there and do this right. So I am a really big reader and I would imagine most of your listeners could be readers as well. Probably. Uh, probably. So I've got a few favorites. Um, do you remember Grey's Anatomy? I do. So I really, 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 really loved Grey's Anatomy's groundbreaking approach to so many different things way back in the day, what, 2006 when they came out. I think. I'll trust you. I, I think it was. You know, it was because I was in Alaska. Carry Different on. story. Uh, so Shonda Rhimes, she wrote a book called Year of Yes. Uh, how, to dance, how to dance it out, stand in the sun, and be your own person. And I think that before, before you can find yourself, or if you're in the process of that, read this book. It is beautiful. It is, I think, slightly life-changing. And if Grey's Anatomy has ever touched you in any way, except for that singing episode... Uh, I think you'll love it as well. The storytelling is is just fantastic. The writing is top notch. Um, and I have another one, which it's called The Little Black Book of Success, Laws of Leadership for Black Women. And it's by Elaine Merrill Brown, uh, Marsha Haygood, and Rhonda Joy McLean. So Little Black Book of Success. Looks like a little cute black book with some pink writing. Uh, it really, honestly, it has a workbook too. It has quizzes. It's interactive, which Ooh. I really love about it. And Every single lesson you're trying to learn, tailor it and customize it to your specific needs. It's a cool book. I highly recommend checking it out. It's not a traditional sit down and read. Thank you for that. Well, for today's Herdacious Spin Fact, we're going to come at you with some breaking news. Since the inception and creation of Wall Street, one fact has remained unchanged. Men dominate the upper echelons and highest paying jobs in direct comparison to their female counterparts in this space. But now we got a new Wolf on Wall Street, ladies. Sorry, Leo. Starting in February 2021, Jane Frazier will take over Citigroup, the third largest bank in the country, becoming the first woman in all of history to head a major U.S. bank on Wall Street. 
Jane Frazier has been with Citigroup for 16 years in advance of this new promotion in which she will be taking over from retiring chief executive Michael Corbett. In February 2021, when Jane assumes the role of CEO, she will be the sole female leader among the top 10 largest banks in the country and will join the ranks of the 31 existing female CEOs of S&P 500 companies. In 2019, women made up only 26% of all senior financial service executives, which is a 6% increase of women in the financial services from 2016. Women in finance are severely underrepresented due to a plethora of systemic industry challenges. Now, in an attempt to address the disparity between the two genders within the job market, Wall Street has tried to be more intentional about recruiting not only women, but women of color. Although these efforts have not been super effective as of yet, we'll keep watching. It is no secret that Wall Street is severely underrepresented from the female perspective, as well as the person of color perspective. In fact, at a 2019 hearing of the House Financial Services Committee, a lawmaker asked Corbett, the exiting city CEO, as well as his executive peers at other top banks, to raise their hands if they believed a woman or person of color would succeed them. And surprise, surprise, none of them raised their hands. Now, Jane is no stranger to the demands the financial world expects of women. In a speech made in Miami recently, Jane said that she was intimidated upon her first jump into the financial sector because all the women at that time looked overtly masculine in the way they dressed and behaved. Hey, we kind of already talked about that, didn't we? Mm -hmm. Indicated what success would look like. Masculine. Jane thought most of these women seemed unhappy as they were not allowed to be themselves at work. Jane sought a way to be both a successful professional as well as a caring mother in equal parts. Although she confesses its difficulty, she was persistent in making it work. Jane worked her way through Citi's ranks from overseeing the Latin American region to being promoted as global head of the company's mortgage business to the role as bank president that she is now, and then future CEO in February. Jane truly started from the beginning, reached milestone after milestone, and kept going. Needless to say, our sincere and heartfelt congratulations are being sent out to Jane Frazier for this new ceiling-shattering moment. We need more women in finance, and Jane is a fine example of the myriad of women who can and do make it to the top. Wall Street might have long been a boys' club, but soon enough, the boys are going to scoot over and let the queens rule. With persistence, a good work ethic, and backbone to boot, we can do this. As we have every time in history, we will break the mold and move the needle forward on employment opportunities for women. Tara, Thank you for all the work you do on moving the needle forward. It's really powerful, and I really appreciate you helping us understand the power dynamics in challenging power today. Thank you for having me. That was beautiful. I love it. Move over. The queens are here. Ah, We are. Now, if you liked our show, please subscribe and please share with another amazing queen who needs us in their life. Until next time, be on the lookout for the next opportunity for you to shatter some ceilings and let us know how we can help. <laughs>